Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black, Bespoke Radio, for the masses, Uh, yeah, let's do this man. Today is Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. 138 days into the new year, only 227 days left. We are live from a bunker. A bunker that is somewhere in the middle of nowhere. A total undisclosed location, but it is beautiful. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? I guess yesterday, I'm going to fire things up right now. I guess yesterday, <clears throat> we... Um, we started started sending should have done this a long time ago started sending the video feed to KGRA that's right into their members area how you doing <laughs> welcome to everybody over there at KGRA you've been getting the audio feed and uh, now you've got the video feed there you go okay so welcome I was over uh, so, you know, I jump around right before the show. Uh, that's why I keep the video off. Cause I'm saying hello over here. I'm saying hello over here. I've got all these keyboards. Man. There's five keyboards in front of me. And, uh, so I got to jump over to each one and, and say hello to everybody. So, um, I got that out of the way and I didn't have a way to go hello to KGRA. So they, they got the shout out. They got the shout out. All right. Wow. What a show we have in front of us tonight. And uh, it is Nick Redfern. Nick Redfern is here. We're going to be talking about Maryland and Martians. Two, two. My favorite subjects going down tonight. Tomorrow night, David Marler is here. And we are going to break down the 60 Minutes UAP special event that was... uh, aired this past Sunday. So that's going to go down uh, tomorrow with David. We have all kinds of things we're going to discuss with uh, David tomorrow and uh, very excited about that. But I've got to get David's, I got to get David's take on 60 minutes. It's going to be good. So that'll be tomorrow night. And uh, as announced, we will have no show on Thursday. Okay, I will be at UFO MegaCon uh, June 6th through the 12th in Laughlin, Nevada. And uh, the links for everything and and the banners are over at jimmychurchradio.com. All right, a live, real, in-person UFO conference. All right, we're going to have new T-shirts there. We're going to have the old T-shirts there. I'm going to have some vintage T-shirts there. Uh, We're going to have some posters. I'm going to have some stickers. I've got all kinds of new merch that we're going to have. And so when you walk into the vendor area, 
walk through right there on your left, right there, corner booth, right, right in front, right there, fade to black. Come by and say hi and, uh, and hang out with us. Okay. UFO MegaCon, Laughlin, Nevada. I am so looking forward to this. If, if I, if I have ever, I'm working, I'm going to be, I'm going there to work, but it's a vacation too. I am going to spend seven days of hanging out with everyone. And I, I so look forward to it. Okay. So UFO MegaCon, Laughlin, Nevada, follow me on Twitter at J church radio. Yeah. Follow me there. And, uh, any questions or comments, hashtag F two BQ and hashtag F two B is the sandbox. All right. Let's get to the breaking news. I announced earlier today that we are canceling this Thursday's show. I have to fly home uh, to Indianapolis to be with my family. My father is in the hospital. And as most of you know, I try to keep my personal life and family away from uh, the public and public view. But I didn't want a bunch of crazy rumors going around about canceled shows and what is going on. One thing is for sure, you know, the show must go on. So tonight, tomorrow night, yes, absolutely. Thursday, we have to uh, take off because I'm going to be I'm going to be flying. Um, I'm scheduled uh, to be back on Monday. And uh, I'll be here for the next uh, two shows, of course. And there's no reason to be on the air uh, tonight, all bummed out and sad. I'm not going to do that. And and I never would. And um, I, I do want to know, I, I do want all of you to know that this... Uh, uh, this terrible situation that uh, every family eventually finds themselves in, you know, the the, the circle of life. Um, it, it has been going on for a while, and, and my dad is strong, but uh, I've been dealing with this now for, and, and, and the family, uh, for almost two years. And, you know, the show's got to go on, my life goes on, your life goes on. There's just no reason to, you know, talk about this stuff every night on the air. But today I got that phone call that nobody wants to get. So uh, that's what happened. And I will uh, be flying out on Thursday. I don't think I'm going to be on social media too much. Um, and uh, I'll be able to spend time uh, with my father and, of course, uh, my family. Okay? All right. And uh, these three golden hours each night spent with you are my escape from the harsh realities of life. So tonight, let's have a good time. Let's talk some UFOs with Nick Redfern. Cool, 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 cool. All right? All right, thank you. Uh, let's get to the other news. NASA has advanced researchers grant money. They have given away grant money. You don't pay this back, right? They've given away grant money to figure out how to get a mission to Saturn's moon Titan and bring back any extraterrestrial life it discovers. This is not a joke. This is a press release. The return journey of the probe, which aims to bring back organic compounds for further study, would be fueled by the celestial satellite's vast methane lakes. The space agency recently presented $125,000. Now... <laughs> Is that enough? 125 grand. Uh, it's a grant from the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts, uh, NIAC, to the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, to figure out whether such a mission could be possible. Titan, the second largest moon in the entire solar system, second only behind Jupiter's Ganymede, is covered by a global ocean comprised entirely of liquid methane. All of this according to NASA's Cassini mission to Saturn. Now, big news announced today. Amazon pauses sales of facial recognition software to police indefinitely. The company didn't announce a, a new deadline. They just said no. And the suspension of sales of the recognition software, that's R-E-K, recognition software, will stay in place until further notice. 
Reports emerged uh, recently that facial recognition programs have misidentified women and also people with dark skin, skin tones, incorrectly flagging them as matches to photographs. And then the ACLU ran U.S. lawmakers, that's right, senators, ran their faces through the software and found several lawmakers falsely identified as criminals. That's right. But of course, no lawmakers were arrested or harassed. Charles Grodin, the actor best known for his roles in movies like Midnight Run, amazing movie, one of my favorites, Rosemary's Baby, one of my men who's creepy in that, Ishtar, some say the worst movie ever made. I say it's friggin' hilarious. I love Ishtar. And my favorite, Heaven Can Wait. Well, Charles died today at his home in Connecticut after battling cancer. He was 86 years old. Wow. Rest in peace, Charles Grodin. Funny dude, man. Heaven Can Wait. <laughs> Ishtar, man. He was great in Ishtar. Yeah. All right, midnight run too. All right, let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Tina Fey is 51. Keyboard God Rick Wakeman today is 72. And Mark Mothersbaugh, that's right, formerly of Dio, and now writes the soundtrack to everything you hear in Hollywood in film and television. Mark Mothersbaugh today, 71 years old. Wes Anderson Films, Mark Mothersbaugh. And... Our dead guy's birthday today is Perry Como. That's right. There's some ladies out there right now that just went, Woof, Perry. Yeah, I know. 1912 to 2001, died at the age of 88. Perry, by any measure, was one of the biggest stars in the world in music, television, and film. Perry received five Emmys a Christopher Award, a Peabody Award. He was inducted into the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame, and he received a Kennedy Center honor. After his death, he received a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award and was inducted into the Long Island Music Hall of Fame. He has the distinction of having three stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, one for radio, one for television, one for music. During a career spanning more than half a century, he recorded exclusively for RCA Records for 44 years after signing with the label way back in 1943. Perry died in his sleep on May 12, 2001 at his home in the Jupiter Inlet Colony in Florida, six days before his 89th birthday. Happy birthday, Perry. On this day in history, 1980, it went down. Mount St. Helens erupts in southwest Washington, killing 57 people and devastating some 210 square miles of wilderness. I remember hearing, they said, I forget what it was, but it was, it was something like five cubic square miles or some, some crazy of dirt and rock blasted out of the ground. It's crazy. Somebody, somebody posted that up on Twitter. Tell me how many cubic miles of dirt did Mount St. Helens belch? Fader fact. Here we go. H.P. Lovecraft was never able to support himself from his earnings as an author. His book, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, written one year before his death, only sold 200 copies. He died in poverty, penniless, at the age of 46. He collect, his collected works and copyrights have an estimated worth of $250 million today. And that is your fader fact. Tonight, very special guest, Nick Redfern, is going to be here with us. We are discussing Marilyn and Martians. We're going to have Martians up first, by the way. That's tonight. Tomorrow night, David Marler is with us. And yeah, I want to break down the 60 Minutes UAP special from this past Sunday. That and a whole lot more tomorrow night with David Marler. And Thursday, the show is canceled. All right, let me hit this River Moon coffee. Ah, 
rivermoonwellness.com. Faded Black Blend. Game changer blend. Uh, blend. Okay. Kaz just said, on May 8th, 1980, the volcano lost an estimated 3.4 billion cubic yards, 0.63 of a cubic mile of its cone. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good data. That's pretty good data. How many cubic miles? How many? <laughs> Kaz, that's good. Thank you for that, and you're very quick. All right. Nick Redfern with us tonight at the bottom of the hour. Stay with me. Got a lump in my throat, people. I'm trying to get rid of it. All right? All right. Well, it's been a crazy week for the UFO community. For that matter, it's been a pretty, pretty nutty month. And actually... A fantastic year, or two, or three, four, right? One of the things that I love to do is give you a list of things that have happened. Because quite honestly, uh, you've forgotten about most of it. Why? Well, because too much happens too quickly. And, and with this out of control news cycle that we find ourselves in these days, it's just too easy to forget about the day before. That's just the way it is, let alone the week or the month, even the year. But yes, we've had some amazing days happen in this little group that we call ufology. By the way, is it... <laughs> Is it ufology or UFology? I'm going with youth. That's right. Every time I hear someone say UF, it just hurts my ears. It's either ufology or ufology, right? That's that's it. That's it. That's it. Either one works, but it ain't UFology. UFology would be the study of those crazy TV channels, you know, like 14 through 83 back in the day. I'm just saying. Oh, wait, that's UHF. <laughs> but anyway, get it right, people. It's youth. Youthology. UFology. You no, anyway. Anyway, anyway. I'm really curious as to how. The 60 Minutes UAP special is going to play out in historical terms. In that, will it be talked about five or ten years from now? How about next week? That's the, that's the news cycle that we live in today. I mean, have we already forgotten about it? Now, as exciting as it was, and yes, it was exciting. It was great. That was an event. There wasn't anything, like, exposed. You know, something like we would say in the future, or the media would reference, like, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but let's quote something, right? Let's make something up, like, quote, the night that 60 Minutes revealed that UFOs are real, that our government is in possession of flying saucers, end quote. That is a reference in the future that I would love for 60 Minutes to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. Because that kind of thing, well, we know now that that didn't happen during the broadcast. So how will history treat this show? Will it be remembered or forgotten? Think about it. Today, today. We still talk about the alien autopsy, and that was a hoax, <laughs> right? But it has stood the test of time, like 25 years of a test of time. Now, almost two years later, after the big event, we're still talking about the Wilson Davis leaked documents, right? Two years, still talking about it. What's going to happen with 60 Minutes? It's been over three years since the release of those three U.S. Navy videos. Yes, still talked about. 
still referenced in the media, TTSA or Tom DeLong, not so much, but, but the way that everything is playing out right now, it makes me wonder about the future. And ultimately, what will the UAP issue turn out to be? Now think about it. Stay with me. Because I can say this with definite certainty. I'm sticking with UFOs. I'm sticking with UFOs. I'm not going UAP. Not going to happen. Let me explain why. A UFO, by definition, is an unidentified flying object. But let's, let's be real for a second. A UFO, to anyone means a flying friggin' saucer from another world. That's it. That's what a UFO means. Nothing more. A UAP, by definition, means unidentified aerial phenomena, which to most means something military, a drone, something from this planet. It's an unexpected explained unidentified aerial phenomena but it means something made by man it doesn't mean et right something the military has seen something the military is talking about the government is talking about that is a uap it's not a ufo somebody is trying to change the way we think about things to shift from et or etc right? An, an extraterrestrial civilization and turn everything towards a military and adversarial issue. Now, I know that there are many out there who want to think that UAP and its issues are actually UFOs, you know, and extraterrestrial. That That's where this is all kind of headed. If you think about it, I say not so fast, slow down, Pull over to the side of the road. Remember what 60 Minutes had as set decoration in the background during the intro to Sunday night. It was the letters UAP, not UFO. Two different things. Had those letters on 60 Minutes said UFO, right? The entire world would have viewed their segment with a whole nother frame of mind. UAP doesn't mean a thing to the rest of the planet. UFO does. And history would definitely look back on their broadcast with a different viewpoint. It was the moment that CBS exposed UFOs, ET, and off-world issues and how our government is dealing with it to the world. That's how history would have looked at 60 Minutes. They missed it. They did it on purpose. You know, I honestly think that that's what the government wants right now. That's what they want. The spin of UFO to UAP. I can't think, I, every time I apply my mind to this and ask myself, why? There's your answer. UAP comes from one source. Do you remember Hillary Clinton? Hillary. Well, you know, it's, it's UAPs now. It's not UFOs anymore. It's, it's UAPs government the government percept the government the government sending us this message it's strange isn't it strange it didn't come from this community it didn't come from ufology ufology is not going to change its term no upology <laughs> i'm just saying I am going to stay with UFO. UFO, unidentified flying object, yes. UFO means ET, off-world, interstellar, 
That's what UFO means. Nobody's going to say anything different. That's what it means. UAP, nobody even really knows. The rest of the world, they're not, no, they don't know. They don't care. It's the government forcing UAP on us because they want it to be a military issue. That's right. And that's how history is going to treat all of this. That's it. If, if, uh, if there was anything that 60 Minutes and their producers and how they did it, if there's anything that they regret, was not having UFO in the background. UAP, whole nother situation. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick to everything that I say. I just want you to think. That's my, that's, that's, that's it. I just want you to think. I just want you to kick back and just apply and go, well, okay. All right. I need to think about this. That's all. I just want you to think. I'm not going to change. I'm staying UFO. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, right here, Nick Redfern. It is Maryland and Martians. We're going to start off with Martians tonight, though, by the way. But it is Maryland and Martians. Tomorrow night, right here, David Marler. We're going to be talking about the 60 Minutes. I'm going to try to keep the 60 Minutes UAP special alive. Media is going to let it drop. Everybody else is going to let it drop. I'm going to let it continue for a little bit. No show on Thursday night. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Stay with us. I'll be right back with our guest, Nick Redford. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. This is Jimmy Church, and I'll be at the UFO Megacon this June 6th through the 12th, 2021 in Laughlin, Nevada. The Laughlin UFO Megacon is unique. It's seven days of education and disclosure. It's unlike all other UFO conferences. The Laughlin UFO Mega Conference specializes in bringing you new people, offering new information and disclosure. All of this is offered at prices so low you can actually afford to be there. For instance, Seven night hotel packages, one or two people, start at just $320 inclusive. Education and disclosure is why the Laughlin UFO Mega Conference exists. Join us for all seven days or a half a week or just a day or two, but join us. Go to LaughlinUFOMegaConference.com. Register now. The only thing keeping you from being with all of us is you. Just go to LaughlinUFOMegaConference.com. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. 
All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, folks. It's trembling times, and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at getthetea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. Getthetea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's getthetea.com. Getthetea.com. The tea that makes you go. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey. You're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Nick Redfern is with us. Tomorrow night, David Marler. No show on Thursday night. Thursday night has been canceled. Yes, it has. All right. Tonight, it's Nick. Nick works full-time as an author, lecturer, journalist. He writes about a wide range of unsolved mysteries, including Bigfoot, UFOs, Loch Ness Monster, alien encounters, government conspiracies. His books include For Nobody's Eyes Only, Monster Files, The World's Weirdest Places, Pyramids in the Pentagon, Keep Out, The Real Men in Black, the NASA Conspiracies, Contactees, and Memoirs of a Monster Hunter. He writes for UFO Magazine and Mysterious Universe. Nick has appeared on numerous television shows, including Fox, History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Monster Quest, and UFO Hunters, VH1's Legend Hunters, National Geographic Channel's The Truth About UFOs and Paranatural, and, of course, BBC's Out of This World, MSNBC's Countdown, and Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive. His links to Nick Redfern, 40 and .blogspot.com are over at jimmychurchradio.com. I want to welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm out of breath. Nick Redfern. Nick, hey, man. Hey, Jimmy. How's it going? <laughs> Nick, is there any TV shows that you haven't been on? That's what I should do. I should just list those um, two shows, and then I could save a bunch of time. Uh, well, I haven't been on Cops yet. But, uh. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you, are, you are the perfect visual uh, for Cops. Your DRI shirt, right? <laughs> Headband, handcuffed. <laughs> that, it would be a great visual. <laughs> Funny you should say that. I got pulled out the other day for going through a red light and... Um, but the but the cop was really good and said I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, take any uh, any uh, 
any events or anything like that. So I said, okay, well, thank you. And uh, he said, just don't do it again. So, oh, so man. That- I, I love those lucky breaks. You know what? Yeah. Um, the thing is with with cops, and this is the truth. This is the truth. I mean, I haven't gotten a ticket in in decades, right? I respect I respect the law. I do. And when they approach you, and it, it doesn't matter if you are respectful, and they can tell right away your aura, right? They they can tell. They can read you. You know. I'm sure they- yeah, you look like a criminal, though. See, so you have to. <laughs> you, have, <That's> true. <laughs> you have to put on a little extra effort <laughs> of the good aura. Well, actually, um, I was going out somewhere, and um, it was like um, it was sort of late afternoon, and um, I'd got like all my piercings and uh, motorbike jackets, and uh, I was like, I'm sure to get hauled off, you know. <laughs> and, uh, or something, but he he was like, "Hey, so, uh, what's going on?" I, he said, "You know, you jumped the lights." I said, "Yeah, sorry, sorry, officer, sorry, sorry." <laughs> and um, he says, "Well, well, I'm not going to take any action." He says, "Just don't do it again." And he said, "Anyway," I said, "Oh, well, thank you." you and he was just like, and then he was like, "Uh huh." <laughs> and and it, you know what's funny? After that, Nick, you stop. At every light, don't you? <laughs> you do at least at least <laughs> you know, for a day. <laughs> Well, for, yeah, for the first, like, 10 days, I was a bit paranoid going through lights and whatever. You know. <laughs> it's, you, you need to be thankful, man. That was the universe reaching out. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, that's right. It was, yeah. And now, uh, I want to catch you off guard a little bit. Um, uh, we're going to get to uh, Martians. I want to do Martians first, and then we'll get to Maryland. But okay. um, uh, I wanted to ask you about this new vernacular this new thing called a uap i'm i personally i'm not going to go for it i'm staying old school i'm i'm staying with ufo do you feel a difference between the two is a ufo a uap is a uap a ufo is one extraterrestrial is one earthly you know what where where i know you're going to give it to me straight right so well, where where yeah. are you on this very controversial issue? Well, I mean, um, basically, whether it's flying saucer, UAP, UFO, they're all basically the same thing. But there seems to be this thing, I don't know, it almost sort of, I won't say it negates it, but it certainly um, it, 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 it doesn't really have the... Um, you know, the terminology of flying saucer or UFO. And I mean, UFO as a term has been around for decades and decades. I don't really see any reason to change it to UAP, which is kind of bland. I mean, UAP, it sounds like some big store down the road. Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to UAP to get some food or whatever. You know? <laughs> but that's exactly my point. UFO, we worked hard, right? (laughs) We worked hard (laughs) to get UFO uh, worldwide, and everybody knows what that means. That's E.T., off-world, little green men, flying saucers, not of this earth. No matter what UFO actually stands for, but that's how it is perceived. UAP, UAP doesn't have that same... You know, little green men and Martians vibe to it. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the term alien. And then you have all these other people who call them extraterrestrial biological entities. It's like, you know, don't ask, don't talk like an ass. Just tell you as it is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're aliens. They're not extraterrestrial biological entities. <laughs> that's see, it, it, Nick. That's why I love you, man. I, I, we are completely on the same page here. Completely. All right, now let's. Um, uh, what there's a, a, a few ways to look at um, your. It, uh, you've got two new books out, uh, but the one uh, uh, before Maryland is uh, Martians, and what I really enjoyed about the book is that you chose to, um, and this is interesting because now we have perseverance today, right, and integrity in the helicopter, but this book was before that, and you chose 
a historical perspective on Martians. Done with intentions. Now, you knew that Perseverance and, and future stuff is, is, is going to Mars, but you chose to, at least the first half of the book, completely a, a historical perspective. Well, there was a good reason for that. And one of the things, Jimmy, I've always sort of noticed in a book where it can affect the reader, you know, and it, and it affects me as well, is when you jump around time-wise, you know, and, and it re you kind of lose that cohesion of, of the time frame. And, um, and it can cause, you know, people to, well, what's he doing? You know, he's jumping around here and he's jumping around there. So with such a complicated story in the first place, with all the different angles of the mysteries of Mars, I personally, I felt the best thing to do is at least find one way to have it, like I said, like a, like a cohesive situation. And the, the one I chose was to do it historically, from point A to point Z, and then I think that gave you know the reader um, a good way to see how not just the story of Mars went, but how our trips to Mars um, you know are, are presented historically in terms of um, you know the time frame as well. And um, because you know with a, such a complicated story, um, you've got to put it in something like that. Really, there was um, if if we go. Uh, somewhat modern, if we say, you know, like Sidonia, right? If we go, you know, like mid '80s, and mm -hmm. and and before, our knowledge of Mars really still is not complete. We have perseverance there now, trying to figure things out. Our knowledge is not complete, but right up until modern times, we looked at Mars with a completely different lens, didn't we? I mean, going back to the 1800s all the way up to the mid-80s, early 90s, we looked at Mars as the home of Martians. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I decided to, to write the book was simply because if you look at all the other planets in the solar system, um, yes, there's some astronomical um, mysteries and anomalies and things like this, but none of them really seems to have the lure and the capture um, that Mars does. You know, there's so many anomalies on Mars that, you know, that you don't see on, like, poor old little Mercury. You know, it's got nothing. <laughs> um, but if you look at Mars, you know, there are so many mysteries, and for that reason also, um, it made sort of the writing of the book easier because there is so many different things to talk about but yeah when you're talking about going back to the 1800s you know there were these rumors and tales that um you know scientists using telescopes had seen canals on mars and um interestingly enough who i talk about in the book as well uh, nikola tesla um, because he believed or, or highly strongly suspected that he might have been um, contacted by Martians. Um, and, and he also pondered on the idea that maybe they helped him on his way with all his, um, you know, sort of radical scientific experiments and technology. So even that far back, and I mean, you can go back even further than that, you know, when... Um, when Mars was the was the god of, of war, you know, and we're talking about going back not just hundreds of years but millennia ago. So um, you know, Mars has played an important role um, in our civilization, in our folklore, our mythology, our legends, and our reality. And of course, you know, it's um, it's so bright, um, you know, you t it's always there. So um, it really. In many respects, it is sort of like um, like a sister um, planet to ours, if you like. Has it um, has it always been that science supported the the message to the public was that there's life on Mars? We can see what's going on. We can see the cities. We can see the canals. We're getting radio signals. They're trying to communicate with that. That was always coming from the science side. 
So was it always trying to, I mean, it was always there to try to make contact with whoever was on, on Mars, right? That, that was the perception with the public. Well, um, it, it wasn't so much in that era that we tried to contact Martians. It was more as what we could see on Mars. And although, you know, a lot of these stories about canals and things out turned out to be sort of superfluous and, um, you know, not really the real thing, but it looked like it. Um, so it was more of a case of us looking at Mars rather than, you know, sort of a, like a, a radical attempt to try and contact Martians. Um, but, and even today, you know, there's this uh, reluctance on the part of NASA to say anything really that, God forbid, you would say something about, you know, real aliens on Mars now. You know, um, NASA has done a lot of great work, you know, scientific ba uh, data on the surface of Mars. But just about every single anomaly that has ever been photographed by NASA, um, NASA has said, no, this is just like the equivalent of, you know, somebody seeing the face of your, your pet dog on a cloud, that kind of situation. Um, and there does seem to be this trend of playing down the idea that there could be um, intelligent life on Mars. And um, I've never understood that, really, unless there's some kind of widespread cover-up designed to... Um, you know, to prevent us from finding out. But um, maybe it's a bit of both, you know. Perhaps NASA just wants to play it carefully in case they get it catastrophically wrong. Um, but maybe there could be a conspiratorial angle to it um, as well. I mean, in fact, that's the approach I take in the book, is to look at both perspectives, you know. Is there a cover-up or are the scientists just too, you know, careful about what they're seeing and, and don't really want to say too much in the, you know, don't want to go down the alien angle in case it all collapses on them and then they're going to look, you know, terrible, whatever. So, um, but yeah, there's always been this to and fro between the scientific community and people like UFO, UFO researchers, uh, people like that. And, um, and, and and that that clash, if you like, and and it has been a clash in some cases. That clash has has always been there. The scientific angle versus people who are sort of written off as not really scientists because they're talking about controversial data. And that's it's unfortunate, you know, that people who've done some really good work but may not, you know, be in the employ of space agencies. It's a shame that they've been sort of, you know, just written off as just quacks or whatever. Well, yeah, and there's there's certainly issues with Mercury, too hot, Venus, too hot. We we know very little about Venus. Um, Saturn, same thing, Jupiter, gas, uh, giant. Uh, Uranus, we don't know much about. It's, it's fairly a new discovery, too, as well. We don't know much about, but there's Mars. And yep. we look at Mars, we look at uh, uh, the photographs that have come back, and it looks like Earth. We can live there, right? That's the way we perceive it. And then, you know, somebody like Orson Welles and, and War of the Worlds um, uh, comes out with that broadcast in 1938, and it was easy for us all to get sucked into that because Mars is just like Earth, right? It has to have life. And we got sucked into it only because of our belief system, because it's a planet that is just like ours. Well, yeah, I mean, this, you're right. I mean, you, the, you cannot really see too much from some of the larger planets, you know. I mean, so it's just, I mean, overwhelmed, you know, with vast thick clouds, and, um, which makes it really difficult. And who knows, you know, if we're able to get really to the surface and, you know, how probes that could um uh, and rovers you know that could kind of do the experimentation and expeditions that they're doing on mars maybe we would find some even more weird anomalies but there's no doubt that just about everywhere you look on mars there's something strange now i guess for most people the one that most people know about or of uh, would be the face on mars 
and it's called the face on Mars because it's this huge um, kind of like a, a carved out mesa um, with a human, eerily human like face pointing out towards the sky and which looks kind of like us with two eyes, a uh, nose and a mouth. Um, now, that particular story, you know, sort of made a, lo a lot of news when it surfaced and a lot of people still talk about that to this day. And also because that area called Cydonia, there are also a number of structures that sort of superficially look like very old pummeled pyramids. And you can make a case that the Sphinx on, in Egypt kind of looks a little bit like the face on Mars. But one of the important things is, and a lot of people don't know this, there's actually not just one, um, um, what seems to be like a carved um, face on Mars. There's actually another one, and it's known as the crowned face. Now, if you go on Google Images and just type in Mars crowned face, you'll see this incredible picture of um, what looks like a carved um, head with a crown, with two eyes, with pupils, with a nose, with nostrils, with a mouth, and with a chin. And it's difficult to deny that for what it looks like. And as I said, it's called the crown face. And uh, Just look for the crown face, Mars, and you'll see this incredible picture. Now, and there's actually another one on Mars as well. Now, I could understand or accept um, the, you know, one huge carved face on Mars, and it may just have been, like I said, you know, the equivalent of your pet dog's, you know, looking, looks like its face on, the, on a cloud, that kind of thing. But um, with the crowned face and the face on Mars and the third one, it does make me think that at some point in the very, very distant past, that whether it was Martians or whether it was visiting extraterrestrials from another planet coming to Mars and settling there, or could it have been an early ancient civilization on Earth that um, destroyed itself and we just have legends about them, but could they have, you know, sort of flown to Mars hundreds of thousands of years ago? I mean, who knows? But what it comes down to, on the surface of Mars, there are at least these three... Um, what look like huge carvings of faces, and it's it's hard. As I said, it's hard to get away from that, um, or to deny it as just a bunch of rocks. You know, the the crown face on Mars is uh, about as fascinating as it gets. And mm -hmm. and when you look at it, is it pareidolia? You know, uh, playing out with this in the extreme. Or, uh, you know, to your eyes, I'm looking, everybody's posting uh, pictures right now. I posted up pictures, too, as well on Twitter. Um, it's pretty convincing, well, probably more so than uh, the face on Mars and Cydonia. Well, the reason why I don't think it's pareidolia was, is simply because, you know, if it was just the face on Mars, that would be enough, in, you know, to take some intrigue in it and investigate it. But when you find you've got three... And you've got these sort of pyramid-type structures as well, also in the Cydonia area. And, I mean, I mean, another one, bear in mind, for people who may not know, that particular photograph, the, the, the crowned face, that's not sort of a questionable photograph or something that somebody just posted on the net. That is an official NASA photograph. Um, now, NASA didn't um, hide it or censor it or anything like that. They just said, yeah, it does look like a face, but we just think it, it's like, again, it's pareidolia. And um, so, it, you know, it's a good, it's at least that NASA let us see it. And, of course, the, the situation is, well, what does NASA say about it versus ufologists and um, people who look into the ancient aliens kind of thing? Um, but for me, you know, three carved heads is is stretching it. If you want to say it's just down to coincidence, but um, but there's another weird picture as well, very weird picture, which is actually I, I also um, reprint this in the book as well, and it's the photograph of what's become known as the face hugger, 
um, after the famous famous after the famous um, uh, face hugger on the Aliens movies with uh, Sigourney Weaver. And uh, if you've seen the movies, you know these creatures that scuttle across the ground. You know with these um, fast running legs and this sort of tail and these spidery legs. Well, there's a picture again came back from Mars. And you can see, just again, if you Google um, face hugger photo Mars, you'll see what looks eerily like some kind of large spidery creature with sort of a circular body and what looks like about eight limbs um, on its body crawling up the side of a, a cave wall. And um, now, whatever it is, if it's alive or it's not, it's difficult to explain what it is. You know, it doesn't look like it, that it fits in with the, the the rock itself. It looks, it really does look like um, something's climbing up it. And if you look at the top part of it, it looks like you could almost make out like sort of two glowing eyes at the top. You know, imagine sort of like an eight foot um, wide spider crawling up the wall <laughs> which would be pretty uh, <laughs> daunting you know uh, but that is what it looks like like i said it's hard to say for sure but um you know if nasa said nasa says well no it's not a a creature that's alive it's not a giant spider well then the question and the answer is well well what is it and, and that's when we get the situation where they just don't want to deal with it, really. Yeah, the first time I saw this image of, of the face hugger, I'm like, well, uh, that is what it is. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's really... And, 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 and Nick, uh, I've got about a minute before the break. One uh -huh. of the things that I enjoy about all of these high-def images coming back from Mars is I look at them and I just see stuff. Right, it just right? It, it, I just see stuff everywhere. It doesn't look alien or unvisited or uncivilized. It looks like stuff to me, and I can find stuff in almost every image. Well, you're right, and some of it looks like human stuff. You know, the, the, the I mean, I always tell people the important thing about the carved faces is that they look human. They don't look like you know the alien on the front of communion. Those those pictures they look like us. And it, there there isn't another way for me to look at it than that. Let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I guess tonight, Nick Redfern. Now up first tonight, we're talking Martians. Right, we're going to get to Maryland in a little bit. But uh, Nick's book, Martians: Evidence of Life on the Red Planet. Links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. More with Nick after this short break. Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. 
Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the lucky pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Nick Redfern is here. His two latest books, A Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies, and The Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe, just released. We'll talk about that at the bottom of the hour. And right now, we're talking about his book, Right Before Marilyn, Martians, Evidence of Life on the Red Planet. And Nick, I wanted to ask you um, a couple of things, and, and these images are interesting. But there's a couple of other things for me that play out here in the modern sense. One, you know, Buzz Aldrin and his T-shirts, right? We got to get back to Mars. And um, and Phobos. And that monolith on Phobos certainly indicates something put that there. That's not a natural formation, is it? No. I mean, if you look at that Phobos uh, monolith, I mean, they don't call it a monolith for no reason, you know, because that's what it looks like, you know. And there's another one as well, actually, on, on Mars, too. Um, and something like that, it's incredibly difficult for nature to create something like that when there's absolutely nothing else around it that, you know, would, would be the same. Uh, <clears throat> so, again, you know, something like a monolith, 
um, which also kind of plays in, you know, with the 2001 A Space Odyssey, Odyssey uh, movie of 1968, um, Stanley Kubrick. I mean, one of the opening sections has um, a monolith appearing, and it helps the the primitive um, pe- uh, people of that era, millions of years ago, to um, sort of um, expand their intelligence. So, um, you know, you have to wonder, you know, is there a bigger story there? You know, is it just a coincidence that, um, you know, we have a monolith in 2001, a space odyssey, and we've got the the Martian uh, ones as well. And um, sometimes I wonder, you know, there's a big sort of bag of Martian secrets that we're not seeing the whole picture. And um, and maybe, you know, contained within those bags are the answers to why we have these monoliths. And um, But, yeah, the, the important thing about them is the fact that it's, it's very difficult for nature to create something like that when it's surrounding, uh, surrounded by, you know, multiple other rocks and none of them have, you know, that kind of dimensions, you know. Now I want you to uh, I want to talk about perseverance, but before we go there, I want your the Nick Redfern theory on this. Do you um, uh, do you believe that there's a possibility that we are Martians, right? That maybe that planet started to die, and they're looking up into the night sky at this blue. Right? We see a red planet. They're going to see a blue planet. They're going to see Earth, and that they came here because they had to leave Mars? Well, I think it's something along those lines. Now, you know, when when people talk about, you know, if there was a Martian civilization, you know, a lot of people think, you know, we could go to Mars now and see, you know, the equivalent of, um, I don't know, a ladder and a and a phone and, and a watch or whatever, you know. But I don't think it's like that. What I do think is that there was some kind of civilization on Mars, but I think we are literally talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago, probably, um, when something went tragically and drastically wrong. Now, whether it was a case that there were indigenous Martians on Mars or there was uh, like a space-faring civilization that came to Mars, which may have been an empty world, and they civilized that. Or the intriguing one that the late Mactonis came up with, he said, well, what if there was a civilization, a human civilization on Earth, long before our civilization, and they may have been sort of been the cause for the legends of like Atlantis and things like that. And Mac speculated on the idea, well, what if it was us, an early civilization on the Earth, and they went to Mars, and we don't realize that humans have actually already been there, but hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, So I don't really, I'm not entirely sure, you know, that I've got enough data to say it's A, B, or C, but I do think there was some kind of ancient civilization on the surface of Mars. I think there's enough data, enough anomalies. um, And clearly now, you know, a lot of it is just uh, pulverized, you know, which you would expect if there had been some sort of kind of a worldwide disaster, whether they're equivalent of like a nuclear war or, you know, a gigantic meteor strike that just destroyed the planet and the atmosphere but, but, yeah, I do think um, there was at one point um, a, a thriving civilization on Mars, and, um, and it's our job, hopefully, to, to try and figure out what the answer to it is. The, uh, uh, I've often said, and now you've included quite a bit of uh, conversation with Mac Tonys in, in the book, and I have said uh, many times, he is one of the, was one of the most intelligent, feet on the ground researchers, very coherent, a very clear way of writing and speaking and, and theorizing about things. There are two people that I never got to interview, man, and that's Lloyd Pye and Mac. 
I, 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 I just wish I could sit down with Mac and, uh, and have, have, have talked with him. His, his part of the book is, is just amazing. Well done. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I was glad I was able to do that, you know, because, um, you know, sort of keep his flag flying, that kind of thing. But his book, um, After the Martian Apocalypse, um, all kind of amplifies, you know, that angle as well of an ancient civilization and trying to figure out what on earth happened to them. You know, why did they die off? Why did Mars sort of go the way that it went? Why is it that there's only remnants left you know, it's, clearly there was something. And I mean, it's possible that, you know, half a million years from now, there could have been a big disaster on Earth and there could be a civilization of humans on the Earth 500 million years from now. And they'll be saying, now there's nobody before us. You know, we're the first ones. And um, I kind of wonder if it could be that sort of situation. Now... NASA, uh, once again, we have Perseverance and, of course, uh, Ingenuity, the helicopter. Would it surprise you if NASA finds something this time around and, and does make an announcement about something? Well, you know, the way I look at it like this, um, we haven't really ever had any kind of definitive thing. And NASA has always said, well, no, it's, you know, it just looks like that or it just looks like this. But... We're, now that we're sort of seeing, you know, all this military footage and intelligence agencies uh, talking about this, and now we've got the the media, you know, like 60 Minutes the other night, um, taking all this subject um, very, very seriously, I kind of wonder if, you know, by adding to the next step of the story, which could be like a disclosure kind of thing, I do wonder if we might get sort of a sudden revelation coming out of mars you know and something that really does look not look like it could just be you know um something made by nature you know so i've got i should stress i haven't got any sort of insider information along those lines but it wouldn't surprise me because it looks like we're getting fed a little bit more and a little bit more and i wouldn't be surprised if mars was not the next thing to have us all sort of um with our Mouths wide open, staring at the at the TV. You know. Well, if they make an announcement about microbial life, or you know something found in the soil, or the evidence of small fossils, yeah, I, okay, I get that. The possibility of that is is very very real. Mars is not that different from Earth, and certainly at one point it was nearly identical uh, to this planet. So there's got to be something there that they can find. But, and they would disclose that. I get that. But, what, Nick, what if they're, you know, they're digging around and they pull up a Coke can, right? <laughs> or, or, you know, something that is not microbial, but something else. Would they disclose that? Well, I mean, it, it's difficult to say because Mars... Uh, excuse me, I mean, NASA has revealed some quite, um, you know, sort of intriguing pictures. They haven't held it away, you know, like so many people have claimed. Um, Mars, um, you know, the Mars pictures have been released by NASA. NASA just denies that what we think they are actually aren't. But I do think, you know, that there, is, there are high chances of finding things. And there's reason why I say that is because, you know, we talked about the, the face hugger. Now, if that's real, that's some kind of animal. Now, if we, we've got, if the carved face, the crowned face um, is real, then that shows um, an intelligence. And we know that Mars has an, a, a massive amount of water, whether it's in water or in ice or in vapor, but it's incredible amount of water. And on top of that, there are also the photographs of uh, what are known as the banyan trees. Again, if you Google Im uh, images, B-A-N-Y-A-N, Martian uh, banyan trees, you'll see what look like these um, trees on the surface of Mars. And again, um, NASA says, well, yeah, they look like trees, but they're just ice particles. 
Uh, but if you look at those pictures, the banyan trees um, on Mars, it looks like the pictures look like somebody's flying over Arizona and um, took a few pictures of a few trees. That's what it kind of looks like, but slightly different to our trees, which you would e expect if they're from another planet. But, it, but the reason I mention that is because you've got water, you've got animal life, um, you've got trees. You put all that together, then I can easily see and how easily it would be for NASA to say, hey, we've found something because there is so much to find. And maybe this will be the time when you know, like with the UFO revelations um, the last couple of years, maybe we'll see a bunch of um, Mars revelations as well. Now, what about Elon, right? If, are we taking NASA out of the play and mm -hmm. now inserting a civilian, right, a, a public company um, that is now going to go to Mars is there going to be the possibility of a, a, a more freer conversation about what is there? I mean, if if somebody from SpaceX, you know, stumbles upon a can of Coke or whatever, you know, on the Martian surface, does that get back to us, you know, without government interference? Well, yeah, the, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, the, the way I look at it, no, I don't think... Um, NASA is going to be eclipsed by um, corporations and companies, you know, they're doing it on their own. Um, but I think the important thing in all of this is that if there has been photographs held back and we've never seen them because they're basically held by a government agency, the likelihood is we won't see them until they decide to reveal the material or they may not decide to at all um but on the other hand if you've got multiple private corporations not just going into say the earth's atmosphere but actually making it to mars and spending you know with rovers and artificial intelligence robotics you know that could potentially stay on Mars and work, you know, for years and years, re highly sophisticated. And this is all being done by private enterprises, which cannot be sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of disrupted by anybody who wants to hide the truth. They wouldn't be able to do that, I don't think. I think the more and more private corporations get into the world of Mars, the more likelihood is that um, that we're going to find things. Now we had uh, uh, the the head of the Israeli satellite program uh, come out, you know, with about six months ago. I feel a sneeze coming on, so if I mute the microphone, uh, everybody will know uh, what's going on. But anyway, where he said that uh, the United States and and other countries here on Earth, including uh, I, I believe Israel, have a secret base on mars now is there a possibility of a, a parallel uh, you know space program that is going on behind uh the actual the one that the public knows about and we have been going to mars and we do have a, a an established base there and is there a danger of Elon Musk seeing, you know what? What if he, right? And and he gets off, and there's a cosmonaut there, right? There's a Russian uh, uh, astronaut or or somebody from the United States, you know, driving around on a Mars rover. Well, yeah, I mean that would be an incredible um, discovery revelation. I mean, um, you know, a lot of people uh, buy into that idea you know, like a secret space program. And, um, you know, the... I mean, it's a fascinating scenario, the idea that there is a secret space program and astronauts um, obviously using some kind of technology far in advance from the Apollo rockets that went to the moon. Um, you know, the, the idea that there could be um, structures and, you know, an entire scientific civilization already on Mar on Mars, trying to make sure or trying to figure out what's on Mars um, 
or what we should show, you know, to the public, that kind of thing. Um, but there's, although there's no proof of it, there's one particular reason why I think there could be a secret space program. And I'll tell you what it is. If you look at the the developments in science and technology and medicine going back from sort of the 1940s, 1950s to the present day, you know, we've gone through, you know, sort of incredible bounds, um, like in, in medical terms, you know, like, um, <coughs> excuse me, ta- um, transplants, uh, things like that. Um, in, you know, you've got computers, which are sort of like the size of a matchbox, um, you know, um, smartphones, iPhones, um, you name it. You know, science has jumped leaps and bounds in incredible ways. But if you look how we get into space, it's still using chemical rockets. And, you know, the whole rocketry angle is really the only one that publicly, at least, hasn't changed. You know, we we are still using um, chemical rockets of pretty much the same kind that took us to the moon and took, you know, like Yuri Gagarin up into space. Um, They were all chemical-based, and even today they are. And so why is it that we've got all these advances in all these other technologies, but the rocket, um, the the, the subject, if you like, um, actually hasn't changed much at all, unless, and this is the important thing, unless... The, you know, we're told that there is no sort of um, highly advanced um, chemical rocket, you know, beyond um, anything that what we've got right now. So I think there could be a sec- not just a secret space program hidden, but also a secret technology, um, because you know, if we were just using um, chemical rockets, there's no way we could do it. There's no way as humans we couldn't do, you know, like a three-year uh, round trip from the Earth to Mars and back again. It just, it's just not possible. It's not feasible. Um, so that there has to be, if, if there is a secret space program, it has to be something that has created a technology far beyond. And, and I also think that if there is a secret space program, I actually think NASA probably doesn't know about it. I genuinely think that NASA is not part of the cover-up of a secret space program. I think they are actually out the loop. Now, people might think it would be incredible that NASA could be left out of the loop, but, um, you know, I think it's possible if that NASA were briefed on it all, there could be so many scientists who just couldn't keep their mouths shut, and so they don't tell them. That's very interesting, Nick. And you said to me, now, with everything you said to me once um, years ago, I mean, with everything that is going on today with UFOs and UAPs and video and the government and the Navy and the Pentagon and everything that's happening today, you said something to me once that I have never forgotten. You said, Jimmy, maybe, I think this was at a conference, or maybe you and I were talking privately, but you said, maybe they're not interstellar. Maybe they're inside of our solar system. Maybe they're coming from the backside of the moon. Maybe they're coming from another planet. Maybe they already have bases established here, and they're not traveling great distances. They're already here. Do you still uh, prescribe uh, that theory? Well, yeah, I do. I'll tell you for, uh, why. The primary reason is because, you know, the incredible distances, you know, the light years that um, that it takes, you know, to get from one area to another. I mean, it's it's almost impossible to to sort of, you know, figure it in your mind, the sheer distance and... Uh, you know, and um, there's not much we can do about that. When you, if you're sort of ten light years away, I mean, there's just no way you can get there. Now, this, we get so many UFO reports that it does sometimes make me think. Well, maybe that's because they, like as you said, they really are already here, and maybe you know they're actually stationed here, may have been stationed here for a long, long time. For example, um, in the 1970s, Ingo Swan. Um, was asked by a sort of a mysterious agency within the U.S. government to remote view 
the surface of the moon. And um, they came away talking about, or kind of shocked, the remote viewers. They were shocked to sort of to their core uh, when they'd seen these sort of large humanoid figures, kind of eerily like us, but much, much taller, like 12, 13 feet tall, and living deep under the surface of the moon. And there's been um, the CIA in 1984. They did a secret remote viewing of uh, the planet Mars. And um, we don't know why the CIA was asked to do it, but they were asked. And it, you can now read that the transcript because the CIA has now declassified it. And it talks about um, how the remote viewers could see also these giant humanoids on the surface of Mars. And there was all this fire coming down from the sky. And it was like Armageddon, but on, on Mars. And... Um, so, you know, it's one of these situations where I think they could have been here for a long, long time and could still be. And um, and on the issue of uh, remote viewing, a good friend of mine, Kimberly Rackley, she's done a lot of skilled uh, remote viewing work on Mars as well and come up with very similar images of, you know, these tall Martians and um, and some kind of catastrophe on the surface of Mars. So... If there was a civilization on Mars and, um, and something happened to Mars, it's not in, you know, impossible that some of them could, could have made it to Mars, maybe even were perceived as gods, um, but were able to survive and start over on, Mar on, on, on the Earth. I think that's a possibility. Um, you know, and um, our job is to put it all together if we can. I, I, is it um, I, I, for me? I, I I just feel like I'm living in the 1950s um, with you know flying saucers and rockets and 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 orbiting hotels and space stations and a base on the moon where space tourism starts next month. B Blue Origin is going to be launching eight astronauts or six uh, next month. You know that's happening. That's real. And Elon is going to Mars. There, there's nobody stopping. There's nothing that is going to stop Elon from going to Mars. Do you feel like we are living in the future that we were promised so many years ago that it's finally arrived? Well, there's, there's no doubt that something right now is going on, you know, with all these developments, UFOs, um, UAPs, um, you know, the, the news covering it more, more and more coming out from government agencies. It's all being taken seriously. Um, film footage, um, photographs, um, senators like Senator Reid, Harry Reid talking about, um, you know, the whole UFO subject as well. I do see, you know, I think there's something on the horizon. Um, you know, I'm just not sure what it's going to be. But as, as I said, you know, when you just talked about, um, you know, the whole angle of um, going to Mars, and, uh, and he's definitely going to Mars, um, that's a good thing because we're talking about, as we said, you know, privatizing things. That's never really, to a significant degree, that has not been done. And, you know, I mean, if there is a super secret space program, and I mean, and you know, another agency goes looking, what are they going to do? Blow them out the sky, you know, to keep the secret. I don't know. Um, but I think the more and more things get privatized, the bigger chance some of these secrets are going to come tumbling out. Nick Redfern is our guest. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We're going to take a quick break right here. When we come back, we're going to switch gears going to talk about his new book. It was just released, Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. 
¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. This is Jimmy Church, and I'll be at the UFO Megacon this June 6th through the 12th, 2021, in Laughlin, Nevada. The Laughlin UFO Megacon is unique. It's seven days of education and disclosure. It's unlike all other UFO conferences. The Laughlin UFO Mega Conference specializes in bringing you new people, offering new information and disclosure. All of this is offered at prices so low you can actually afford to be there. For instance, Seven night hotel packages, one or two people, start at just $320, inclusive. Education and disclosure is why the Laughlin UFO Mega Conference exists. Join us for all seven days or a half a week or just a day or two, but join us. Go to LaughlinUFOMegaConference.com. Register now. The only thing keeping you from being with all of us is you. Just go to LaughlinUFOMegaConference.com. Fader Knots. When you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Church tonight. Nick Redfern is here. Man, it, you know, Nick is one of those guys that I can just sit and talk to forever. We agree on everything. Music, rock and roll, food, shoes, and E.T. And more with Nick in just a second. Uh, right now, I've got to talk to you about Virtual Shield. Virtual Shield VPN. You need your own VPN now. Right before uh, I came back uh, during the break, I was standing right over here in the studio, and I'm looking back and and I'm just observing, you know, the lights and the action, and all of the computers 
that are here in this studio, each one connected to the internet, each one its own dedicated Ethernet connection, each one protected with Virtual Shield. You need your own VPN. There is too much going on uh, in this studio. This is an undisclosed location. Nobody knows. Nobody follows me. Nobody knows my traffic. Nobody knows what I'm searching for, what I'm doing. It's because I have Virtual Shield. You've got to get Virtual Shield VPN today. A strict no log policy. That's it. There is no logging of what you're doing on your computer on the internet. That's first. Second, complete encrypted servers all around the world. That's what you need to have protecting you. And it's all simple to do. Click on the link in the video description box below. It's that simple. You can also type into your browser the last time that you'll be doing this, right? Type in virtualshield.com forward slash fade to black. Do that. You will get Virtual Shield VPN for 50% off today. Get your, get your VPN now. What are you waiting for? Quit messing around. Get Virtual Shield VPN. Our guest tonight, Nick Redfern. And uh, before we get to Marilyn Monroe, Nick, I had heard, I just want to run this by you. I had heard from a scientist, uh, uh, an astrophysicist, he said, he goes, Jimmy, you want to survive on Mars? All you got to do is breathe the first six inches of the ground down by your feet. There's oxygen there. Have you heard that before? No, I haven't heard that, no, but that's interesting. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, the movie Rob is Robinson Crusoe on Mars. Um, incredible movie from the 50s. Uh, go and watch that. It's this whole, there's actual oxygen. Just get into a cave and you'll be able to breathe. And uh, very, very interesting that the right down on the ground, compressed, right down at your ankles, you can, you can survive. You're not going to, you're not going to walk around a whole lot, but you'll be able to lay down and survive if you had to. Uh, so there you go. All right, let's get to Maryland. You had said, uh, I, I found this so interesting. You said to me last week, you go, Jimmy, are you hip to the Maryland UFO connection? I said, I am. He said, man, it is the best story. And it really is. There is a lot of evidence here to support uh, this idea that Maryland was getting ready to uh, spill the beans. That's correct. Yep, yeah, that's exactly the story. And uh, where did um, uh, where did you choose to start out with this? Because, uh, of course, we have uh, JFK, we have Robert Kennedy, um, and what may have been going on uh, between the three of them. There's that part of it. But what supports the UFO side? Well, the story itself um, goes back to 1995. And... Um, that was in the year, or that was a year in which um, a document surfaced um, which appeared to be a, a, a legit um, CIA document that talked about Marilyn Monroe and UFOs. Now, before I get to sort of the, the content, I'll explain how the document surfaced. Um, in the early 1990s, a UFO researcher named Timothy Cooper um, said that he had contact with a number of what we call whistleblowers, sort of, you know, Edward Snowden types, um, like Deep Throat in um, and the, all the president's men, that kind of thing. And he actually was given, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents that talked about alien autopsies and um, crashed UFOs and secret UFO programs. And um, Cooper... Um, said during the course of this, he was given this one-page document, which was, as I said, looked like a CIA document, and it was basically uh, the content of it was a conversation, a wiretapped conversation between two people. One was um, a well-known journalist in the 1960s no uh, known, uh, named Dorothy Kilgallen, and she had a good friend named Howard Rothberg, and from uh, Marilyn and two other sources, she was reportedly um, 
able to sort of share with her friends the story of Roswell, crashed UFOs, dead aliens. And according to the document, the CIA was very concerned about this story getting out um, because she got the story from the Kennedy brothers. And basically, you know, they'd sort of tried to impress her into the bedroom, so to speak, and, and did so by sharing with Marilyn some of the government's most um, top secrets, like, for example, plans to invade Cuba, to assassinate uh, Fidel Castro, and one of the others um, was the issue of aliens and proof that the government had crashed UFOs and dead aliens. And supposedly, um, as the document states, all of this information was given to the Kennedys, as I said, to impress Marilyn. Um, and the CIA was listening, wiretapping, and the document is dated August 3, 1962, which was one day before Marilyn died. So the inference is that somebody shut her down quickly um, to try and prevent the story from coming out. Now, when people say, well, isn't this just too, you know, just too much, the idea of the Kennedys, Marilyn, and UFOs all together... Now, what we can say for sure is that the document itself, the, the typeface, is actually a 1950s through the 60s um, typeface on the, on the typewriter. Um, we know that the paper was the right paper for that era. We also know um, that the heading is, uh, it looks real, everything looks real. And more importantly, or equally importantly, Nobody ever came forward, you know, with kind of like a gotcha, you know, practical joke kind of thing. That never happened. Nobody has ever come forward and said, you know, this was a hoax on my part or a psychological um, operation to see, you know, how people can be sort of, um, you know, sort of fuddled and whatever by giving them fake stories, that kind of thing. That never happened. No one ever tried to make money on the documents at all either. So, you know, we have this very intriguing document handed over to Timothy Cooper by what was believed to be an, an elderly CIA, excuse me, CIA archivist who um, handed the, co the, uh, the documents over to Timothy Cooper. And that's how the story started to surface. But round about 96, 97, the story stalled and it kind of went away. And, but I never really let it go away. And so over the years, I've sort of continued to follow the story. And I thought, well, now, 2021, um, we're talking about... Um, now being able to sort of do a full-length book on the whole story. And so quietly and carefully, I did that over the last few years and until, as I said, you know, I'd got as much material, which I felt told, you know, the story to the extent that I was able to. But, um, but yeah, that's basically the story, um, you know, the, the leaking of a document uh, from the CIA um, talking about how Marilyn had been told by the Kennedys about crashed UFOs and aliens and plots to kill Q, uh, to kill um, Castro and things like this. And the CIA was so concerned that somebody decided she's got to go before she blows the whistle. Now, um, and I've seen, uh, I, I believe this is the same document that you're talking about, the CIA, Marilyn, a document. And in that document, there are two other things that stand out for me. One, it mentions Project Moondust. Yeah. That, uh, I've, I've got another. That was a sneeze. Now, you heard it. The rest of the audience didn't. That was pretty loud. <laughs> that was pretty loud. Um, it, it mentions Project Moon Dust, and then down at the bottom of the document, I see MJ twelve there. Um, what what is is that a for nineteen sixty two? That's pretty revolutionary to me to have Moon Dust and MJ twelve in a document that mentions Marilyn Monroe and this wiretap conversation. 
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as far as uh, Project Moondust, for people who may not know, Moondust was a US, a real US um, Air Force program. And initially, it was designed, like, say, for example, um, if a Russian satellite came down, a Moondust team would go out to retrieve it, you know, get there before the Russians did, and it would allow us to you know, analyze, you know, Russian technology. Or let's say, for example, a Chinese fighter plane crashed over the Pacific, and again, American personnel were made able to um, retrieve it and see, you know, how advanced the uh, the Chinese were, that kind of thing. However, there have been rumors for years that Moondust was also in the business of retrieving crashed UFOs. Um, so you have both signs. Um, now, the document is dated 62, and the the earliest documents that I personally have on um, Moondust is 1954, and I've seen stories of 1953. So, you know, the, that does fit in. Um, now, as far as the, the other parts of the document, it actually it says MJ-12, and it all says 5412. Now, like a stamp on it, 5412 was a, a very covert organization in the government, which had nothing to do with UFOs, but it had everything to do with um, sort of helping uh, on programs like, you know, plots to um, overthrow um, Castro. You know, it was kind of like, um, almost like the, the, the James Bonds, if you like, of the government. Um, now, as far as MJ-12 is concerned, you know, you either buy into it or you don't. Um, now, if there was a real Majestic 12, um, then it would have to have existed as far back as 1962. But then, of course, you've also got um, researchers who don't buy into the existence of MJ-12 itself. So, you know, it's a very um, complicated story. Um, but I wanted to tell the whole story, you know, without um, trying to push it down one avenue or another. I just wanted to totally go where the evidence was. And if there's a problematic thing here, a problematic thing there, well, let's see how we can find out, you know, um, can, we, can we go further into it and find further data that actually, you know, um, that actually shows that it is um, valid. I mean, for example... Um, the two people who were uh, mentioned in this CIA document um, in relation to what it says in the document about what Marilyn knew about Roswell and crashed UFOs, one of the people um, who was mentioned was a friend of um, Marilyn, um, Dorothy Kilgallen. Now, in the 50s and 60s, Dorothy Kilgallen was a very well-respected journalist in the United States. Um, a lot of people don't know that going back to the mid-50s, um, she developed a big interest in UFOs because in, the, in, in May 1955, she went on vacation to England and she was given a story by Lord Mountbatten, one, a, a major military figure in the UK. Um, um, she was, Kilgallen was given by uh, Lord Mountbatten um, a story suggesting that the UK and the US were working on a highly classified program to understand what these crashed UFOs and dead aliens that they got in their hands were. And from there, um, Dorothy Kilgallen continued to have this interest in UFOs and never really went away until the, way, until the day she died. Now, and talking of the way she died... Uh, she died young, uh, just in her early 50s, and um, she died in bed and under very uh, mysterious circumstances. And this was also at the same time when she was digging into the, um, the JFK assass assassination. And on top of that, um, she also into the, was the, uh, one of the very few people given... Uh, permission to interview Jack Ruby, who shot Lee Harvey Oswald, who shot JFK. So you have got these threads and connections with people tied to the JFK assassination, with Marilyn, and so on and so on. 
uh, with Marilyn and Kilgallen. You pull all these together and you start to see these threads um, that tie UFOs with the Kennedys and with Marilyn. There is, um, in this document, of, uh, uh, and uh, this is a transcript of uh, a wiretap phone conversation between Kilgallen and Rothberg, and there's this one line that freaks me out, Nick. I want your comment on this, especially when we think about the timeline of 1962 when these types of conversations weren't part of uh, pop culture which is this, that um, allegedly Marilyn was told that then-President Kennedy went to an Air Force base to check out E.T. parts, right? (laughs) To to look at debris. No, no, it actually doesn't say that. (laughs) Now, what what it says was that the president, that Marilyn had been given information suggesting that he um, had gone to what was described as a secret air base. It, Marilyn didn't go there. No. no, not Marilyn. No, 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 no. I'm not saying Marilyn. That the president oh. told her that he went to a base, a secret base. Yes, that, yes that's correct, yeah. Okay, uh, you, you misheard me or I misspoke. But, no, uh, that's okay. okay that, but let's stay, <laughs> let's stay on point here. That's yeah. an extraordinary statement for 1962, that President Kennedy is going to a secret Air Force base to look at crashed flying saucers. Well, again, the inference is because it was a, the base itself was secret, not the you know the data was not just the data was secret, but the in the document the base is called as being secret. So the inference is well. It's got to be Area 51. Right. Because, right, right, you know, right. most other bases around the company have their own secrets, but the bases themselves aren't secret, you know. That's a diff- very different thing. Um, so, on most people who've read it have suggested, well, yeah, that does sound like Area 51. Now, what's interest, very interesting about this um, is that is the year 1962. Now, 1962 was supposedly when JFK went to Area 51. Now, also in 1962, a movie came out um, called Seven Days of May. And it's a really good um, novel, and it was put it, uh, turned into a movie in 1964. And it's basically about a group within the U.S. military that tries to overf- uh, overthrow the U.S. government and turn it into like a military coup kind of situation. Um, and if you read Seven Days in May, um, it's actually got a secret base in the story, and it's called Site Y. And Site Y is not in Nevada, <laughs> like Area 51, but Site Y is deep in the desert of South Texas, and no one can get out there. Nobody knows about it. The president doesn't know about it. The government can't figure out where it's getting its funding from. And if you read it retrospectively, it's, it comes across just like Area 51. And um, so, you know, we have in fiction in novels and which was ter- and one that was turned into a movie seven days in may you've got all of this going on in 1962 talking about um area 51 and what's more intriguing is that the novel itself the authors were friends of kennedy and he actually pushed them to try and have a movie version of seven days in may um put into into a movie and it actually was made into a movie in 1964 and the the guy who who, who uh, plans the um the plot uh, to take over the u.s um was burt lancaster the actor and the one who sort of saves the day is kirk douglas um but what's intriguing as well is that at one point um but uh, Lancaster's um, character is in a room and Kirk Douglas come walking in and they're looking at this big um, map on the wall. And well, what do you think that the map actually shows uh, on the screen? It shows the, the map is showing Roswell, New Mexico. Um, now, 
that may just be a coincidence, but JFK, we know for a fact, 100% fact, tried to get that book talking about Site Y and the secret base. Um, he was, JFK was able to put enough pressure to get the, bo- the uh, movie made for 1964. And obviously, he didn't see it because he was killed in 63. However, you know, you've got all these, in- again, all these intriguing connections like Site Y, Area 51, the secret air base um, in the documents, and all of it revolving around 1962. The uh, seven days in May, Nick, mm-hmm. for, for 1964 is one of the most intense, nerve-wracking, crazy movies you can ever watch. It's it's an unbelievably intense film where you're thinking, no, this can't go down, right? Well, what was funny in the movie, they were thinking, this can't go down. This is impossible, right? The overthrow uh, by the military, and it's a roadmap how to get it done. Even even by today's standards, it's an intense film. Incredibly great film. Well, yeah. Well, the two authors were Charles W. Bailey the second, and and Fletcher Nebel, and they did a number of books together. And they were not just your average author. They were plugged into with a lot of people in the White House, in the government, and there's no doubt that you know they got information on something that clearly was an outline of like area 51 you know and as i said site y in the book and in the movie you know it's um site y is out in the desert nobody knows about it the the government can't figure out who's funding it or even where it is um and so again you know you've got these threads that sort of parallel what's being read in the marilyn documents as well Let's uh, let's take our break right here, Nick. Uh, when we come back, we've got to get to the Robert Kennedy side of all of this. And one of the things, I want to ask you this really quick. I've got about 45 seconds. When people discuss, well, you know, this, is, this, this would never happen with pillow talk. This wouldn't, these kind of conversations, I would say that's exactly when this kind of conversation would go down. No, you're right. I mean, just because somebody is a powerful politician doesn't mean they don't screw up now and again, you know. And and that's exactly when it would happen. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Nick Redfern, we're talking about his new book, Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe. More with Nick after this short break. Stay with us. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Why is it we're not very good with our health regimen until it's too late? We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, Does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So, log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. 
KGRARadio.com. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard. Available at OrangeGuard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest, Nick Redfern. And right now, we're talking about his new book, it was just released, Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe. Now, Nick, going, uh, getting into some of the details that are, that are covered in the book, well, I don't want to disclose a whole lot. I want people to go and buy the book. But there are some other uh, details for me that I think are quite telling. One, and this is never really discussed in the press and has been overlooked, um, but Robert Kennedy uh, was seen by witnesses at Marilyn's house um, right before she died. Yeah, that's correct. Um, if you go to the, the FBI's website, which is called The Vault, it's vault.gov, um, you can read the available um, files on um, Marilyn Monroe. I say the available ones because a lot of the files vanished years and years ago we could be talking about thousands of pages just you know sort of um burned shredded or just put away uh, to you know hide and um but the important thing about it is if you go and read the available files which runs to a couple of hundred pages you see numerous references to people who knew that um robert kennedy and marilyn had um had an affair and um, this theme runs throughout the uh, FBI's Marilyn file, and it talks about um, where reportedly Marilyn and uh, Robert Kennedy had met, had sort of, uh, and, and um, travelled around together, and um, had sort of covert meetings. And um, to give you an extent to which uh, the FBI was concerned about this. In 1974, uh, Norman Mailer 
wrote a book called Marilyn, and he talked all about this, the Kennedys, etc., etc. And this was not this was 1974, and the FBI was still um, putting files together on Marilyn, and she'd been dead since 1962. But the FBI was very concerned about these rumours about uh, Robert Kennedy, far more so than than John Kennedy. Um, but if you read those files, they're very, very deep, and they show the reasons why the FBI was watching uh, Marilyn. And um, a part of it was because she was developing an interest in communism. And um, the other angle was she actually applied uh, for a visa to go to the Soviet Union, which um, J. Edgar Hoover did not like. Um, and so those were the primary reasons. But, of course, when, you know, the, the affair started and the rumors began to surface that the Kennedys had tried to impress um, Marilyn by sort of giving the, her information on some of the, you know, the biggest secrets out there, uh, or not out there, <laughs> I should say, um, that's when things really sort of sped up for the FBI and they, they had agents follow her um, when she went in, in March, I think it was, 1962. But it was in 1962 she went to Mexico on vacation and um, while she was out there, the FBI followed her. There's an entire section that talks about um, what they did on that vacation, who with, and et cetera, et cetera. And those are not questionable documents. Those are officially declassified files, which, you, you, as I said, you can read them in PDF format um, at the Vault website. Now, um, there's another part to this that we have to seriously consider. Um, Marilyn, huge star, much loved uh, in the country, and we know about... Um, the connection between, you know, she sang happy birthday to him at, at Madison Square Garden. We know these things about them. But how serious uh, would the public have taken Marilyn if she did come forward, like is has been suggested by many people, and including this book, about UFOs and secrets and, and John F. Kennedy and the government? Would, you know, is that something that would have been believed? Well, actually, yeah, that's a good point, because, I mean, you really do have a gamble. You either silence Marilyn and get rid of her so the story never comes out, or you gamble that she gets the story out into the public domain and to the media, and people then listen or they don't, you know, um... I guess we'll never know. But what I would say, it would be an incredible gamble to let her get away and say everything that she knew um, rather than just saying, well, the easiest thing is to get rid of her. You know, the gamble would be a big one. Um, and, of course, it may sort of open up other angles as well, such as, as I said, you know, plots to invade um, Cuba, to kill Castro, and also references to um, elements of the government sort of doing deals with the mafia, this kind of thing. And nobody wanted any of these sort of different angles to come out. It wasn't just the UFO thing, you know, they wanted all of it kept hidden. Um, so somebody over eager, you know, might have crossed the line and... Before you know it, you know, big news the next day, Marilyn's dead. Well, now, um, and I want your opinion on this. You know, we're, we're talking about Camelot here, right? We're talking about the Kennedys. Um, do you think that, you know, because to, to put any of the Kennedys in a dark light, uh, it's heresy, right? <laughs> you just don't do that. But yet... Uh, Robert Kennedy was seen by witnesses with a couple of other guys, and apparently one of them had a uh, a black uh, uh, doctor's bag with with them um, at her home. She's later obviously found dead, but that would suggest that Robert was there. Robert Kennedy, right, Attorney General, 
is is there to uh, make sure that she's killed. And and now we're talking about murder. We're not talking about a suicide. Would that have been done, hypothetically speaking here, uh, with the knowledge of uh, then-President John F. Kennedy? Well, I think it would be a, a slightly different scenario. I think, you know, the, it'd be more along the lines of there were people within governments who had deep concerns as to what Marilyn knew and what she'd been told by the Kennedys. And more and more people in the intelligence community were getting more and more concerned. And so somebody said something along the line. I mean, this is hypothetical now. You know, somebody said something along the lines of, you know, she's becoming more and more of a problem. And then, you know, you see these pictures like... um, you know, characters, what we call fixers, you know, somebody will get a job done and everybody else can look the other way, that kind of situation. And so I don't think, you know, there'll ever be, and I don't think there ever has been, you know, a document that says, please assassinate Marilyn Monroe tomorrow morning, that kind of thing. That would be, that's ridiculous, you know, that something would have, anything like that would ever happen. A document like that would never be made. It would be just... You know, some per- one person tells somebody else, somebody tells another person, and, you know, then you have someone who's hired, um, no names used, and some that person gets the job done. And nobody takes the, um, you know, the, the angle for having done it, and, um, and nobody wants to know. You know, that's, that's yeah. how... Killings often happen. It's like it's left to somebody to do. Now, there's uh, uh, to get uh, into this a little bit deeper. Um, my memory says, and you talk about this in the book, but there was also conversations and 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 theories laid out in the past about this, which is that the medical examiner. And correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, Nick. That's fine but that the medical examiner suggested that she took around 100 pills. Now, that's a lot of pills. <laughs> that, is, yes. that is a lot of pills that you would have to ingest. If you're going to commit suicide, are you swallowing 100 pills, number one? And number two, did they ever find these pills in her stomach? And number three, was all of this just based on a blood test and and toxicology that came back with the amount of drugs in her system that it wasn't necessarily 100 pills that were found in her stomach that no. maybe this was injected by this doctor guy, right, with the doctor back. Well, yeah, this is where it gets really controversial because, um, as you said, with toxicology and alcohol in a system, you know, I mean... And if you're not in, if your mind's not in a perfect state or particularly bad state, you know, because of the the drugs and the alcohol, um, you know, it's you're not going to be in a particularly um, perfect state, to say the least, you know. And um, it's a, she was someone who was very emotional, and um, you know, she was the kind of person who. You know, when she was sort of uh, pushed away by the Kennedys, you know, she felt very sort of, um, you know, ignored and forgotten. And so that's why, you know, leading up to um, the, her death, she was very depressed and crying and, um, you know, just felt everything was going wrong for her. And, and that was in, also included in with her career as well. And... Um, and yeah, you, you, well, you mentioned about, for example, the the doctor. There's been a lot of weird stories coming out of uh, Marilyn's house on that night, um, with discrepancies about when she actually died, where in the house she was found, about doors being left open to allow somebody into the house, things like this. You put all that together, and the fact that she had this diary, that's why I called, which she referred to like her diary of secrets. That's why I called the the book, my book, the same, the diary of secrets. Um, But what we know 
is that when her body was taken from her home, a lot of her own uh, personal items were taken to the um, to the morgue, and a number of the people who spoke, oh, excuse me, who worked there, spoke on the record to say they saw that diary um, in the rooms. Um, for several days and then suddenly a bunch of people came in and the diary was gone so a lot of and that all kind of goes back to the night of when she died and you know with the drugs the alcohol but also with you know claims of um, somebody injecting her with you know really high drugs um, and the fact that um, you know we've got the, the door being left over a lot, you put all these issues together and it does sort of paint a picture of either putting in her a state of mind where she felt life wasn't worth living and trying to push her further and further down that pathway. It may have been like, a, you know, sort of a halfway through like a suicide and possibly something that was sort of pushed further on her as well. Um, and possibly, you know, that uh, there was this um, second layer, if you like, of drugs injected in her as well. But what we can say for sure is that a lot of, there are a lot of discrepancies from round about 8 p.m. on the night before she was found dead and through to the following morning and when the police and the ambulance came at, uh, in the morning. Um, I don't think we'll ever really know the answer, but there was a lot of mysteries surrounding her during those few hours. Now, we've uh, uh, talked about, there's a, a lot of talk about the, the CIA's memorandum in this document about the, uh, the transcription of a tapped uh, telephone call. Um, are there any other supporting documents uh, with this that have surfaced? Well, one of the intriguing things that surfaced was that when I started to do the research on this, um, and I kept this quiet for a while because I wanted to make sure I could sort of keep doing the investigation without somebody else kind of um, blowing it all up too quickly before we had the, all the data in hand. You know, if you're going to look into something really controversial, you need to do it carefully and slowly, not sort of run around like a mad thing, you know. And one of the things that I found, uh, I mentioned earlier um, that the document was handed over to a guy named Milo Spiriglio. And Milo Spiriglio was both a writer, or an author, I should say, and a private detective. And he wrote three books on Marilyn. And the document was handed over to him in 1995, uh, as I mentioned, it was originally handed over to a UFO researcher, Timothy Cooper, um, back in the early 90s. And, um, and Cooper then handed it over to Spiriglio. And Spiriglio, in 95, put on a press conference to say he got this document and he wanted to know what people thought of it. And, um, and that, that was basically the, the story. And it never really went any further with Spiriglio. However, I used the Freedom of Information Act just to see if there was anything um, in the CIA's files on Spiriglio. And I was amazed when I got through the mail a batch of documents um, that showed for years um, that Spiriglio was being watched by the CIA, of all people, um, a talk when every time um, Spiriglio brought out a new book or talked about his theories about Marilyn in the newspapers, the CIA photocopied all of these stories, all of these newspaper um, articles, and put them in this lengthy CIA file on Spiriglio. And what's interesting is that where the words... Um, secret diary or diary of secrets are mentioned in the newspapers somebody in the cia took a black marker and put a line under those words diary of secrets now that document is not a questionable one that was released to me through the terms of the freedom of information act and and shows that the one man 
who got his hands on that Marilyn document was being watched and watched and watched. And um, so that's an important aspect that sort of, you know, gives us another angle on the document side. You know, there's the original document, the leaked document, and then we've got the guy who the document was handed over to then finds himself being watched by the CIA. So I don't sort of view that as as lightly. You know, I think that is a, a good demonstration that even back to the 80s, that's when the file started on Spiriglio, they were still concerned about what Spiriglio had found out about that diary. And, um, you know, bear in mind, this was 1962 um, when the... The, the document, excuse me, the diary vanished, and it was the 1980s um, you know, uh, when the CIA was looking into all this, and it just went on and on. So clearly, you know, years after Marilyn's death, um, you know, the CIA was still concerned about these rumors going around about this diary and it vanishing. So. And, and what about the FBI? You know, we we talk about the CIA a lot. Um, did the FBI blow or uh, push all of this to the side or were they also concerned about, uh, you know, suicide, murder, UFOs? Did they investigate? Well, as far as we know, the FBI did not sort of do, you know, a lengthy, um, or at all, um, you know, investigation of Marilyn's death. You know, that was done by, you know, at the, um, uh, the uh, you know the um, with the doctors you know that was prim- primarily done with doctors and medical personnel. Um, the police were there, obviously the local police, and and it did become you know a big um, police investigation. Um, but in terms of the FBI, um, the the FBI file on Marilyn goes back to 1955. And that's when they opened their surveillance file on her. And that goes back to when, as I mentioned earlier, about Marilyn wanting to um, get a visa so she could go to Russia to see what Russia was really like, because she was sort of developing an interest in communism. And, um, and that was because of her connections with Arthur Miller, one of her husbands, um, who was sort of um, like a pro communist he was a sympathist uh, he got caught there was no doubt about it yeah yeah and um it was basically a situation where j edgar hoover sort of flipped when he found out that of all people marilyn monroe one of the most famous americans wanted to go to russia and see what it was like so that's the reason why um marilyn basically was watched um and well but what's interesting is that the first file on Marilyn, that this 1955 one, the FBI actually made a copy of it to the CIA. So both agencies were watching her at the same time. They also, some of the files show that the uh, Department of State were watching her as well. So within the government, it's like everybody and, and his brother was watching her, you know, across the, um, the years. And... Um, but there's a lot of material contained in that file which shows the FBI was particularly concerned about these rumours coming out about uh, Marilyn and Robert Kennedy, lesser so in relation to JFK. They were just sort of um, sort of small references. And um, the, the conclusion on a lot of uh, Marilyn researchers is that... Um, that Marilyn and JFK may have had um, sort of um, situations together, if you like, maybe once or twice. But with um, RFK, according to the files as well, you know, we're talking about um, sort of multiple meetings. Um, So he was sort of perceived more as the, you know, sort of the the dangerous one in terms of, of what could actually come out. Do you think, uh, we just have a couple of minutes uh, left, Nick, and, and thank you so much. Another great show, another great conversation. 
Do you think that uh, the different agencies, including the FBI, and you have the LAPD, which, you know, this happened in L.A. County, but then yeah. reaching out beyond that, other agencies, um, that they did find uh, conclusive proof of a relationship of, of any na- between the three of them, but that was going to stay buried. There was no way that this was going to come to the surface, and may never. No, and I mean, whether, you know, the, we don't know the extent of it all. There's very, very little doubt among any of the researchers. You know, there's very doubt, uh, small doubt, if a doubt at all, um, about the issue of did she have an affair with the two of them. Well, yes, she did. Um, what we don't know is the extent on the part of both brothers. JFK, a minor amount. Um, RFK, you know, much more so. And, um, and as I said, if you go through the FBI's file at the, um, at the FBI's website, um, which is vault.gov, um, click on the PDF file on Marilyn, and you'll see all of these rumors being sent to um, Hoover by various special agents of the FBI around the country. Every time one of these rumors surfaced again, it was quickly sent to Hoover. So, you know, the, whether or not the stories, all or all of them, were true or not, the fact is, it was, it was you know, kind of like dirt kind of never goes away, you know, mud sticks, that kind of thing. It was a case of, well, maybe part, some of the stories are true, Maybe some of them were exaggerated, but the important thing is, if the story gets out, it's just going to get escalated even more. So that was one of the main reasons. They just wanted the whole thing put away. Now, if there was one person out of this entire circle that knew everything, that would have been Peter Lawford, right? In that Marilyn would have confided, that was her best friend. He was there with her constantly, and if she talked to anybody, it would have been Peter, right? I, that's my opinion. I think he was the one that was the keeper of all the secrets. Well, yeah, Peter Lawford, uh, that, at that particular time, a very successful um, actor, uh, did a lot of movies uh, with Frank Sinatra. and um, But, yes, if you read, again, the files, you know, and one particular file that talks about how Peter Lawford pretty much knew the, the 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 full story of what happened and why it had to be done. Now that doesn't mean that he knew uh, anything about the UFO angle, but it does suggest that um, he knew that something was going to happen because, uh, to them at least, Marilyn was becoming more and more of a liability. Um, for the government. But, I mean, the terrible thing is, you know, it's not somebody's um, right to dictate, you know, whether somebody lives or dies, you know. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I've always looked, you know, through all of this, and I've read all the books, right? I've read every angle, including yours. And I always come back to Peter. What did he know? You know, and you think about all through the 60s and 70s and his appearances on TV and his career and everything else. And you just go back and think about what what he had gone through and what was it that he actually knew. And I think uh, Peter Lawford is, is, but he's no longer, you know, the list of people that knew that are no longer with us, it's all the key individuals in this entire saga. Yeah, and I think the problem today, of course, is that just about everybody who was around is not around now you know, totally not around. Um, and so one of the reasons I wrote the book was partly to see if it might actually bring new people to come forward. You know, that's one of the good things sometimes of writing a book is that, you know, somebody may come out of the shadows and say, hey, you know, I've got ABC of this, you know, that kind of situation. Um, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a long chance and you may not get anything. But then again, you just might. And, you know, the, the more, the, uh, even just a little tidbit here or there, I mean, could really open the thing wide open. And that's one of the important things of how, you know, governments work. Sometimes, you know, government agencies 
when they think they've got you know, secrets locked down, sometimes they haven't. I mean, you look at the NSA, National Security Agency, one of the most secure facilities, and yet um, Edward Snowden was able to get out and essentially hand over, you know, all those documentation that was handed over. And that happened partly because uh, sometimes agencies do not foresee what might happen and I think that could have been kind of a parallel with Marilyn, that um, something happened that no one could ever imagine could happen. You know, the connection between the Kennedys and Marilyn and them uh, recklessly telling her secrets, and then she decides to blow the whistle. You know, you could never imagine having all that happen. And yet, situations like that in politics actually do happen. So. Thank you so much, Nick. Another great night with you on the show. What's your next project? What do you <laughs> you you are always writing? What what's coming up next? Um, well, I've got another book that comes out later this year. I think round about October. I don't think it's been actually planned yet, but it's um, it's sort of an A to Z book on everything to do with time travel oh man perfect thank you so much nick be safe out there my friend you too jimmy you're the best nick redfern and the new book is diary of secrets ufo conspiracies and the mysterious death of marilyn monroe i have read the book it's an incredible read you've got to go and get yours and of course Everything Nick related is over at nickredfern 40 and .blogspot.com and the links for that are over at Jimmy Church Radio. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back. Stay with us. Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church, and I'll be at the UFO MegaCon this June 6th through the 12th, 2021, in Laughlin, Nevada. The Laughlin UFO MegaCon is unique. It's seven days of education and disclosure. It's unlike all other UFO conferences. The Laughlin UFO Mega Conference specializes in bringing you new people, offering new information and disclosure. All of this is offered at prices so low you can actually afford to be there. For instance, seven night hotel packages, one or two people start at just $320 inclusive. Education and disclosure is why the Laughlin UFO Mega Conference exists. Join us for all seven days or a half a week or just a day or two, but join us. Go to LaughlinUFOMegaConference.com. Register now. The only thing keeping you from being with all of us is you. Just go to LaughlinUFOMegaConference.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. 
Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right, one year. And as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30 day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Thank you, Nick Redfern. Both books are incredible. Um, I've got them here. Just you've got to check them both out. The um, uh, the Martians book. What what I found so great about it. I mean, it, Nick has compiled the history behind life on Mars and and where it started and the public reactions to it and compiled straight through chronologically. It's it's very very well done. It's a great read. It's a great read. Um, all the way through to today. So that that is a book that everybody should just check out. It's a great reference book, uh, too, as well. And then, of course, the new book, A Diary of Secrets, um, about Marilyn. This is, um, and again, Nick is just such a great writer in the way that he presents it. But this book, uh, I intentionally tonight um, kept out, uh, there are reasons to go and get the book. You've got to do it. Um, I, I kept everything out. I, a few juicy parts to this, but the story itself is just so compelling. And, uh, the book is a great read and, and it, it dives deep. It's got everybody in it and referenced. It's well done. A lot about, uh, uh, two as well. Uh, there's some, uh, uh, a lot of knowledge about uh, the space programs, both here and in Russia, that were going on at the same time. And you see this together in a linear sense on how it's uh, it's all related. It's, it's a very well-done book. It's very well-researched. So everybody should check it out. And that's right, that, that diary is missing, the Diary of Secrets. So there you go. The links are over at uh, jimmychurchradio.com. Thank you, Nick. Another great night on the air. Oh, something happened in Twitter tonight. I was getting ready to post uh, the picture of Nick wearing his fade to black shirt. And right as I was uh, putting all of that together, if you were watching on YouTube, you saw, or uh, watching the video, you saw this happen in real time. Uh, Mark Tarana over in uh, Australia posted the picture as I was clicking go and they both launched at the same time. I was like, man, Mark, how did you know I was going to do that? And I remember uh, Mark pulled it from my original Facebook post from years ago um, and the line that I used. I remember that Nick weren't uh, sporting his colors. Um, but it was really funny how that happened right at the same time. I, I, I totally dig it uh, when that kind of stuff happens. So anyway, there's Nick in the... Sandbox feed wearing his fade to black shirt. It's just classic. 
All right, with that, I've opened up the phone line, 747-228-2051. Again, no fader night this week, uh, no show on Thursday night, and I doubt there's not even going to be a replay. It, uh, uh, that's it. Uh, there, nothing is going to happen on Thursday night. Okay, I'll be traveling. I'll be on the road heading back to Indianapolis. Let's get to the phones. Let's see who's up first. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? So anyway, there's Nick. Okay, in. you got to turn me down in the background. I'm just going to say this one time. Turn me down in the background. And I've opened up the okay, phone. that's it. That's it. That's it. That's how you get blown out uh, that easily. You got to be ready. Folks, you got to be ready. You got to be ready. You're listening to the show. And you're on the phone. You're listening to the show on the phone. You know I'm getting ready to go, hey, you're live. Who's up? You got to be ready. You got to be ready. Okay, hold on. I'm going to do this really quick. <laughs> but, man, you've got to be ready. Don't play around. You've got to be ready. 747-228-2051. Let's see who's up next. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Are you ready? I'm very ready. Hi, Jimmy. It's Carrie in Palm Springs. Hi, Carrie in Palm Springs. You know, you're fast becoming, you know, like our, our, our favorite caller. <laughs> wow, that's a huge compliment. Wow. Oh, well, uh, Jimmy, when, when, when are you going to come to a conference so uh, you can hang out with the rest of the Fade or Nots? You know, there's a chance that I might come to UFO MegaCon in Laughlin. Okay. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I'm going to try and make at least a day or two of it. It's right know? down the street from Palm Springs. I know. I know. I mean, now that you've know, said that, that yeah, now that you've said that, you really don't have an excuse. So there you go. There now you you're going to hold me to it, right? All right. So what's on your mind? Well, Jimmy, first of all, you know, I just want you to know that all of your Fader family is thinking of you, holding you close in our prayers and in our hearts. And, you know, we just, we're here for you with everything you're going through with your dad. And we just want to extend love, peace, healing, and that we're here for you. Lean on us, please. All right. Thank you for that. And, uh, you know, my intention... Uh, was to stay positive in the show because I can let Sorry. my mind go uh, to a place that, you know what, I, and that's just going to bum everybody out. So thank it. you thank you for that. I appreciate that, well, and I know you mean it. Let's move on. But my okay. dad hears you, okay? <laughs> my Good. family hears you. Good. And uh, th there you go. Okay, so uh, what did you think of the show tonight? I thought it was awesome. Nick Redfern, wow. What a, you know, he's so amazing. He's so talented because he can go Martians, Mars, and Marilyn Monroe UFO connection. I mean, that's just like, that's a wide sweep. And, um, you know, kudos to Redfern because he's really, he's really um, bringing it. I, I think those pictures that show all of the artifacts on Mars are really remarkable. And my deep feeling is that there was some sort of catastrophe that happened on Mars, I don't know how long ago, you know, that really wiped out that civilization. But I feel sort of this intuitive connection between ancient Mars artifacts and dwellers with the ancient Egyptians. I don't know. I feel this just connection. And I, I could be way off, but I really think that, you know, NASA uh, is going to find something. And it's, you know, you follow the money. That's why everybody's going to Mars, right? That's why Elon Musk is going to Mars. That's why China's going to Mars. That's why we have, you know, the umpteenth rover up there. Follow the money. They're not going to other planets. They're going to Mars because they know something's there. It's undeniable. The little crab creature, the faces, the pyramid. I think it's just like look at your calendar and count down the days and the minutes. They're going to announce something. They are. That's my guess. Yep. I, no, yep. they are. I um, uh, And I say this with um, 
a, a very cocky attitude when I when I say <laughs> this, and that is when I look at the high def images all over Mars. You know, the high def yeah. stuff, not the low yeah. def. I'm not. You know, you look at the high def stuff, and I see things, and it's yeah. it's not natural things. It just looks. Um, civilized. I, I I don't know how else to put it. There was a, a one picture, um, and this was a, a number of years ago, and and it's on Curiosity, um, from Curiosity, and and Curiosity is going down through the middle of this valley, and you see these two mountain walls on each side, and I and on the right side of this image, up on the this this wall. Man, there is a couple of buildings there, and one of them uh, had like a round circle above it. I, uh, uh, this this spherical thing. Anyway, I had said, and I wasn't joking about this. If I was walking through the desert, and I've got no food, I've got no water, and I need a uh, hope of a direction to walk towards. You know, to 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 hopefully rescue myself. I'm looking at this. That's where I'm going. I'm going sure. to that on the side of this hill. I'm going up to that because that is a building, and you can see it. It is clear. It is is something Very. you know, and it's not. Uh, it's not some. I, I don't care what anybody says. It's not a natural formation. That was no. built. You know, and and that's my take. And I'm very cocky when I say that. I am being very assertive here in in what I am suggesting. You know, that's where I'm walking towards. I'm walking towards that. (laughs) And I don't even know what it is. But that, to me, is going to save me, whatever that is in the image. I mean, I think there's just like rock, rock, chaos, chaos, suddenly an organized structure, you know? It, and I bet there's like, you know, hundreds of feet of dust and rock and debris covering these ancient civilizations there because, you know, we're seeing peaks of them. And just like the tip of the iceberg, they're just like, you know, sparse pieces of these unmistakable uh, artifacts. And so it's extremely exciting. They should uh, have. I'm they, right, right. They need to have ground penetrating radar um, yes. uh, right now uh, and 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 get it done and quit playing around. We have the technology; we are able to do it. That's done. And uh, the next uh, helicopter that goes to Mars, it better be big, and it better have <laughs> yeah. some ground penetrating radar on it. And let's go, uh, not some little pocket sized drone. No, we need. You know, let, let's let's send something there, something big, and and you know the other part, uh, Carrie. Before I let you go, um, why aren't they going to where the water is? We know that there's snow caps, and I know that some of this ice is is carbon dioxide. You know, uh, you know, it's not you know water ice, but there's water ice too. Why aren't yeah. we going there? I don't. I, I. I swear, I'm perplexed with like the most fundamental question. Go to where the ice is. Go to where the I, water you know, is. I wondered that too. It doesn't make any sense. You know, I don't know. They're afraid of the crabs. Those giant crabs. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Carrie, enjoy the rest of your night, and I look forward to hanging out with you uh, this June sixth through the twelfth, right there in Laughlin, Nevada. It's going to be great. Sounds Thank you like so much. Plan. Thank you. Fade to black. Fade to black. Thank you so much. Carrie in Palm Springs. And uh, that's a that's a great conversation there. I, I, I agree with her. You look at some you, you look at the face hugger image. That face hugger image is incredible. I don't know what it is, but that's that's not some natural formation of rocks. You know, no, it's not. It it and and I'm I'm not going there. I don't have to. The face hugger shows something very organic, and it looks like to me like it's alive. Now maybe it's a fossil. Could be a fossil, but 
but it's a fossil of a face hugger. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? You're live. Yes, this is Karen Herbert Timmons from Texas. This is who? Karen Kerber Timmons from Texas. Oh, hey, how are you? Unbelievable. I'm good. Uh, tell everybody who you are. Uh, this is Karen Kerber Timmons, and I'm the sister of Kevin Kerber, who uh, passed away three weeks ago this evening. Thank you so much for calling in, Karen. This is a surprise call. Um, and. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys have a memorial uh, on the 23rd for Kevin? Yes, it'll be this Sunday at 2 o'clock Central Time. And uh, how are you and the family doing? No, well, doing pretty good. I actually um, had a dream the other night on Saturday, and I actually saw Kevin for a brief moment. And what did he say? Was, <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he just gave me a look that look yeah it was that look and it was just not a scary thing it was just very calm and he just faded away temporarily wow wow mm -hmm. um the outpouring of of love and friendship and support um that that we had for kevin it just made me feel um, you know, I, I, I only knew Kevin for, uh, a few years. I felt like we had known each other forever, but you always do that when you have a friend, right? Um, but, oh, but wasn't that just incredible to have the fader not, uh, just make themselves, uh, aware to Kevin that, uh, well, I was just blown away. You did an outstanding job, Jimmy, and just the different, you know, the many fader knots that came in. I'm a new one. I'm part of the family now, fade to black. Right on. And I just, it was just very well done. I mean, I, I just could not have asked for words of encouragement, comfort. You know, I laughed, I cried, you know, it was just very well done. And I appreciate all that you said and all that you did to pull that together. It was just very, very special. Well, and I just want to thank you for that. Yeah, and 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 thank you for that. Um, it was, it was something that it was, it was. It turned out to be easier to do than I thought. I didn't think I'd be able to get through the show. Right, I, I'm just mm -hmm. letting you know. I mean, straight up, that there is no way I'm going to be able to get through this. But um, as the show moved forward, I found it easy. I did. I did because mm -hmm. of the way now I got tears. Okay. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> but, That's but, okay. Not a problem. but as we started to get through the show, um, I, everybody found themselves in, in the same boat. Um, we yeah. were profoundly sad. We were saddened. Uh, it was way too sudden. Um, uh, we had that last uh, phone call with Kevin and I that I have not gone back and listened to. Uh, I, 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 did. I, yeah. listened I, 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 I listened to it. I listened to it, and it was very overwhelming. But it was so Kevin, and it's just something I want to play later on. But I actually brought myself to be able to do it. I didn't think I'd be able to, but I thought I need to listen to that. Right. I really do. Right, right, and it was right. very good. And, uh, really I, I just couldn't do it. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to at some point. Um, and so many have, uh, gone and listened to it and, 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 and told me how they felt about it. Um, but, uh, that was also something that I didn't want to do for the show that night. I could have right gone back and, you know, but that's, that's not. That wasn't the spirit of the show. The spirit of the show was, you know what? Let's celebrate the life. Um, listening to that, we're all going to go into a zone, right? <laughs> and go, wow, wow. That was such a, it was such a deep conversation. It was deep thought, and I remember him catching me off guard with it. I had to, I had to really think mm -hmm. about. Uh, what he had asked me, you know, parallel worlds and, mm. and alternate Kevin's and am I responsible? That was a heavy, deep philosophical <laughs> question. That was heavy. It was. 
It really was. But it was so him. We had just numerous conversations like that. I mean, we would get into some really deep stuff. And he could go really deep with things. I was like, where did you come up with that? You know, where did that come from, Kevin? He had so much. Yeah. And you looked, um, uh, uh, when you looked into his eyes in, in the pictures that Mm -hmm. we had of him, very wise, very, there was Mm -hmm. a lot, there was a lot going on there. (laughs) You know, (laughs) Um, you think of, uh, uh, um, uh, Leonard Skinner, right? Simple man, simple kind of man. That wasn't Kevin. There was nothing. There was nothing simple to that guy. That's good. That's good. Karen, thank you that so is- much, and uh, uh, I, I will uh, get uh, the uh, the notes of uh, the memorial out there on social media for everybody. And and if you can, okay. uh, you know, you're going to have a very busy day on Sunday. But if you can think about it, uh, let everybody know that myself and the rest of the Fader Knots and Rita and everybody here um, uh, think about and talk about Kevin all the time. We miss him. And just give everybody our best, please. Well, I appreciate that. And my best to you, Jimmy, with your father and your family and and having a safe trip and all. And um, keep you all in our prayers. Yeah. and, uh, And Karen... I'm done with the bad news for a while. Okay. <laughs> I'm yes. just done. I'm done with the bad news and the sad news. You know, um, I, I, it's just, it's just like, wow, what a month, what a month, what a year, but, uh, year. that's it. But again, our thoughts are with you, your family, and of course, Kevin and, and please, if you can just let everybody know that this audience, this family, thinks about and loves and appreciates everything that Kevin not only did for us, but did for the world. Okay. And I really mean that. I appreciate that so much, Jimmy. And I'm winding down here with my river moon coffee in the mug that Kevin had that says fade to black. Thank you so much, Karen. Enjoy the rest of your evening and give my best to your family. I will. And same to you. Thanks so much, Jimmy. It's time to fade to black. (laughs) I'll talk to you, Karen. You got it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Kevin Kerber's sister. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, Karen said to me, now I got a lump in my throat. Uh, I've only got a few seconds left. But Karen said to me, she said, I would listen to the show. And, uh, uh, and, and especially when Kevin and when Kevin, when I would say, okay, Kevin, give it to us, give it to me. And, and he would, and he would do his thing and she enjoyed that so much. And, and she is really cool. She is really cool. Uh, Karen Kerber. Thank you so much for that, Karen. And with that, I am going to get out of here. I want to remind everybody what's happening, uh, tomorrow we've got David Marler here and David is sitting on one of the biggest collections of UFO documents and research in the entire world. And uh, he is compiling and going through that. And he allows other researchers to come in and, and do their work. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. And of course, I want his reaction and opinions on what happened this past Sunday with 60 Minutes and their UAP special event. All of that goes down tomorrow night. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Another great episode of Faded Black. I want to thank, of course, Nick Redfern. What a great conversation. Faded Black's executive producer is Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast on a copyright of 2021 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with David Marler, I want everybody to be safe. It's time to fade to black. <laughs>